Dude, honestly, who gives a fuck about what I have to say about the game? Because Wario's in this game. Despite me never really liking Mario Land before this marathon, I ended up changing my mind on it and really enjoying it, hence my positive outlook on the game by the end of that segment. But that can't really be said about its sequel, Mario Land 2. Because I've always really liked this game. There's no point where I've played it and haven't had a fun time. But this is the calm before the storm, let me tell you. But let's focus on the calm and get into this game, because there really isn't as much to talk about as I thought. And the reason for that is because this game doesn't have much to offer, only having about one hour of gameplay and one new power-up, which is really lame, but I guess I should talk about that now. First off, power-ups don't pause the game like they do in the rest of the series, which is a good change. Sure, the transformation animation is slightly, and I do mean slightly less satisfying, but it's really not worth sacrificing a few seconds of gameplay time for a slightly smoother animation, so I like this change. There is also one new power-up. If the mushroom is a tier 1 power up and the fire flower is a tier 2, then the magic cat is a tier fucking 7. The carrot isn't the most creative power up out there, only allowing you to hover in the air for a few milliseconds for each time you tap the A button, and it doesn't grant any combat bonuses. It's a fine concept, but oddly enough there isn't a cap to how many times you can press the A button in a second, so it just ends up being overpowered in retrospect. If you can mash A at a semi-competent pace, you can easily skip an entire level given that there's no walls in the way. It's not even that fun to use in the first place so I always end up skipping on this item unless if I really need it. Which is never because this game is fucking easy. I'm not lying when I say this but I didn't even die once throughout my entire playthrough of the game. It's just a little weird to look back on. I'm not even saying I'm really good at Mario, I'm above average at best. This game is just really easy for the most part. A big part of that is that the controls are way more refined, with higher acceleration and deceleration, as well as things meant to make the playing experience more fun with the small amount of screen you have, like a lower top speed. The spin jump is also way, way easier to use, as you can use it while airborne and it's simply mapped it down, but the trade-off for better control with the spin jump is making it essentially useless. Now it's only uses to break blocks below you, which was already one of its in Mario World, but are you really going to need to break blocks below you that often to make it the sole ability it has? But they did make it easier to use, and I suppose that makes it safer to use. But outside that, there's just a lot of things that make this game kind of easy. Enemies are less common than they should be, the bosses are all super easy to cheese, you oddly almost never see pits in the game, which I can only assume is the case because of the extra screen crunch that obviously comes with making sprites bigger. In fact, it's kind of weird how this game isn't super hard in general given the way bigger portion of the screen Mario takes up. But looking at the game in full, I can definitely see why it's not hard as it should be, and that's because of 1. Mario being consistently set a little behind the camera giving you extra room to see, and 2. Because of the enemies. They all move super slowly, which I don't think was a technical issue more than compensating for the screen crunch. And honestly, if it is intentional, it's a pretty genius design quirk that I don't think I've ever seen in another old school game like this. But sadly, I think that's the only win the enemies get. Again, the variety of them is great and all, but that's just the standard at this point. It's the expectation. What I really want to talk about is the shit pertaining to the enemies. First off, none of them have good designs. It's because the designs are inconsistent as shit. Some of them are as normal as a Mario game can get, while some of them look like they came from an obscure Japanese RPG released on the NES way after its prime. Like, look at this enemy design. Am I meant to feel any type of emotion while looking at it? No. Of course not, because it's just a fucking ant. Some of the enemies also convey how they function really poorly, like this ant that looks like it's got a sort of helmet on. You think that this would just act like a regular ant with an extra hit or something, but no. For some fucking reason, he grows these spikes on him when you jump on it, even though nothing from the enemy's design tells me that. Honestly, if I had to give any credit to the foes you encounter in this game, it'd probably be that this is the first appearance of Wario, who as you guys know is the best character of all time. But we'd better fucking appreciate that he's here, because the only other appearance in the mainline Mario games he has is in a mini game in New Super Mario Bros. To which I say, what the fuck? I hope you guys realize that it's been 32 years since Wario's been featured in a mainline Mario game, and you guys are never gonna make another Wario Land. I don't want better fucking come out because I love this goober. He has such a great design, with Mario being the ideal hero and Wario being the complete opposite, only in it for himself. He has such a great personality too, being obsessed with money and treasures while completely brushing over everyone else like girls. Which, which side note, 
In Wario Land 4, there's this character called Princess Shakura, and she's easily one of the most underutilized characters in the series, right next to well, Wario himself. But at the end, she's returned to her normal form since she was stuck as a shape-shifting cat the whole time. And after that, she gives Wario a smooching bed and just goes to fucking heaven, implying that she was dead, I guess? Well, that's so stupid, just keep her around! Because she's without a doubt become one of my favorite characters in the series, just being a chill as fuck person. She's a cat for most of the game, sure, but she's also a shopkeeper where she does this amazing little dance while she waits for you to buy an item, and she gives you a free smile if you don't have any coins. Like, that's just charming to me, having a character not completely repulsed by Wario for once. They really should have kept Shakura around because she's one of my favorite characters in the series. They could have even kept her as a shopkeeper doing a funny dance and I would have been fine with it. Oh yeah, we were talking about Wario. Wario is a super fun character, but his fight here isn't great. I've always I've always liked the concept of bosses using the powers you have access to, but it's quite frankly over in a minute. It's a really anticlimactic way to end the game despite being the super short one hour runtime of the game. And yet it's still somehow the best boss, because the other bosses are really, really, really easy like mindlessly easy some of the bosses i legit don't know what their attacks are because i kill them so quickly they don't even have creative designs or anything it's just witch or rat the only bosses that have a little bit of creativity is the return of tadanga and the three little pigs how the fuck did you mess this up nintendo hey at least their arenas are cool looking the whole game has unique locales like this they're really awesome and these are shown off really well on the world map on the world map there's a giant pumpkin a koopa that eats you a giant tree the fucking moon a mario mech and my personal favorite giant house that shrinks you before you go into it and all of these correspond to different worlds and keep in mind all of this is shown on a tiny island which is pretty crazy the individual level themes are really cool too it's awesome how the level theme corresponds to where you are on the map like having a chimney section where it is in the macro world or taking place inside of a whale at the spot on the map where the whale's mouth is or my personal favorite having the entire level themed around balls where the mario mech's crotch is the world map also shows off how good the game's presentation is for the hardware. The map doesn't look quite as good as Mario World's, but I appreciate the things that stand out like this amazingly smooth water effect. Also, since we're here talking about the world map, I might as well talk about the level structure. You can choose to do each of the worlds in whatever order you want, and you can even just stop mid-world and travel to a different one if you're really struggling on the level or just want to do it later. This is a unique way of doing things in a platformer, but I still think it's the way to go in terms of platformers. On the world map, you can also do other things like play levels outside of any given world as well as gamble all your coins away to get extra lives or power-ups. Yeah, you can get a whole stash of coins in this game rather than 100 coins automatically exchanging for a 1-up every time. And they're useful once again, the casino. But even though the world map gives me super high expectations for what's to come, the level design is good. Nothing in particular excels, it's just good and nothing more. It's honestly really consistent, and the only levels I ended up not liking were the few water and auto scroller levels, just by proxy of them being water and auto scroller levels and not because of the designs themselves. But even then, the water levels aren't that bad, they're still a little too slow, but for a Mario game the swimming isn't nearly as slow as it usually is. And again, there's almost no water levels in the entire game so it ends up being almost dumb to point out. And that final level ended up being so disappointing. Mario World's final level was really fun while this level just ends up being good but nothing special it could be to do with the fact that the f it could be to do with the fact that the level is quite linear in nature there's no alternate paths and the path you're meant to take isn't too interesting mostly just boring obstacles that don't do anything new still i do have to give it credit because it's one of the only levels in the game that ends up being a little challenging one of the bigger complaints i have for the game is the amount of slowdown it's not common to the point that it ruins the game and you won't be experiencing it every seven seconds but it's just common enough for it to be a complaint without a doubt i think the slowdown is a result of the much larger sprites. I mean, Mario Land 1 already had its moments of slowdown, so it's obviously gonna add up if the sprites are twice as fucking huge. But it's honestly kinda commendable that the game doesn't lag all the time. I mean, again, Mario Land already had its laggy moments, and realistically, it should happen twice as often, but it doesn't. Nintendo also pushed this Game Boy to its limits with the soundtrack, because this has always been one of my personal favorite Mario soundtracks. Much like Mario World, it makes use of light motifs throughout the entire soundtrack. I don't think it was done quite as well here, I think it's a bit more obvious. But the soundtrack is overall way better than Mario World, with the highlights being damn near every track, especially that credits theme. Not gonna lie, this game has taken the top spot on the list. 
I think the only thing holding it back is again, the length. It's only around one hour if you're decent at the game, which is pitiful. This game could have had two more worlds, which would still mean a short game, but it would at least be slightly longer. But to be fair, if the game was any longer than eight worlds, it'd be extremely noticeable that the game was being dragged out. So maybe just adding extra levels to some of the worlds would be another way to do it. Especially since there's only three levels in the total world and a stupidly short space world with only two levels. In terms of gameplay, Mario 2 and Mario Land 2 are pretty toe-to-toe -to -toe with one another. They're really solid games with a lot of similar qualities, but given Mario 2 is just a port of an already existing game and Mario 2 is more thematically creative, I think it's clear that Mario Land 2 is going at the top spot and it's going to stay there for a good few games. Especially since the next game is... Yikes. I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat it. I'm really not looking forward to this one. Mostly because I've never exactly liked this game. Remember all my previous exposition talking about overhyped games and how my perception of them is affected by the consensus on that game? That has been foreshadowing to this game and I'm really not looking forward to the comments, I'm going to be real. But hey, I guess I'll see what I think after playing it again. But now, I think you should definitely play Mario Land 2. It's a great game and it's really bite-sized if that's something you're looking for. But it's a super solid game that people often overlook and I hope that this video brings more attention to it. But now, I think it's time for a mob to arrive outside my window. So, here we go.